Do a quick little intro. All right. So we're starting in three, two, and one. So we're here now. We're live with Karan from the Nice Cast, and uh, we've been setting this up for a while. Yeah, Thank I appreciate you, having you coming me, on. I, I was I was kind of nervous, you know. Uh, this whole having yeah. you started, uh, getting you on here, all started back with that uh, that response video to you, and I did. I was like, I, I hope I hope yeah. he sees this because I'd love to talk with him about it. And uh, yeah. You asked me to watch it, and I watched it, and it was a good response video. <laughs> Thank I'm not you, I lie. appreciate. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think you bring up interesting points in your, uh, even if I don't agree with them, in the content that you make, and I think it's you know leads to a discussion, which I, I always enjoy going back and forth. That should be the point, you know. I, I feel like we that gets lost in terms of people's um, the way they get get caught up on the subjective element mm -hmm. of things. If if you have an opinion about a book, movie, TV show, political event, other tragic event, and you, you, you share that with others, it should be able to, to start a dialogue. Instead of like, even if that's how you feel, I, I feel like the, the dialogue too many times is why do you feel yeah. that way? And not necessarily about the overarching point that you're actually bringing up. At least from my perspective, that's, that's what I've seen happen a lot on yeah. Instagram. It's definitely sure. a, a place for argument that argument for argument's sake and argument for uh i just want to disagree with you and i just want to change your mind oh 100 yeah. yeah, i think yeah. instagram's a lot more like, uh it's a better place i think than uh, i think twitter's the the hell hole for that <laughs> yeah twitter's just relentless relentless and it's so easy to get sucked into everything yeah. Um, on Twitter, it's kind of like sometimes you have to take a step back and, and just say, okay, you know what, what are, what are we really doing here? Um, that was actually a tough thing that I had to come to terms with just very recently because um, I'm kind of moving the nice cast in a different direction. Like, of course, I still love films and pop culture. It's always going to be a part of my life. But, um, you know, so you get sucked into to talking about things that you don't even necessarily mm -hmm. own. And it's like, it's like you're creating for something that is not even yeah. yours and you're fighting these wars <laughs> and these battles on the internet um and i i've, I've been using the phrase low-hanging fruit a I lot recently <laughs> and uh <laughs> and i think that's that's that was the the realization is no yeah. more low-hanging fruit I, type of things so i like when you told me to come come on for this conversation the reason why i was really excited to speak to you is because i feel like we're gonna have um kind of the, the thing you're going with this whole culture bomb thing is you i think you'll be incorporating much broader yeah. conversations which which mm -hmm. i yeah, i don't want to uh box myself in on one thing uh you know i love exactly you should yeah you exactly should. i agree but uh that is something i wanted to touch on is uh the new direction you're taking uh your online uh persona what are you going to be so people your people will watch you and follow you uh what are they going to see from you now like on mm -hmm. your instagram page um I think you'll still see film related things if that's what you maybe saw me on an, on the explore page and you were, you were like well, who the hell is this, this guy? guy that said twilight um, was low key hella dope <laughs> <laughs> you'll never live that down it actually will. <laughs> you're gonna see a twilight you're actually gonna see a twilight renaissance as soon as that first picture of robert pattinson comes out as batman there's gonna be so many people going back to twilight and you're gonna see the hype a hype train for twilight it's about to be wild i'm warning <laughs> you um but yeah, you're you're still gonna see me speak about films and things of that nature, but in a much more different context. I think I, I'm moving past the idea of um, there's something that I look back now, and it's even just been a couple of weeks since I've kind of made this transition. But it's like, how the hell did I speak that way? Is sometimes what I what I think about myself. So I won't be saying um, like the MCU is trash, for example. Um, I think the way I'll say it now is it's I'm not the audience, I'm not the demographic, and it's not my cup of tea mm -hmm. personally. But what the MCU has been able to accomplish, for example, just using them is is, is amazing. And you know, as I'm trying to now figure out what I want to create a substance on my own, it's um, it like puts things into perspective on how difficult it is to to write. Forget writing an entire film, write write a scene. Um, write any type of cohesive story. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. was on um, Joe Rogan's podcast, and he was talking about how it's always a, it feels like a miracle to him how people line up in the frame and the lighting is right, and all these various factors that it's so easy for us with our smartphones to be like, yo, that was yeah. trash. Um, but all these wild things have to come together just to 
produce maybe like 10 seconds mm-hmm. of footage uh, i you know and when you start thinking about it in that macro level it's like okay i i, I personally now no longer am in, intrigued by the idea of of the quote-unquote hot mm-hmm. take anymore. Oh, you're the king of the hot takes. For me now, it's all about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. the irony. Because they always say, like, n- know your audience. And that's another thing about social media, right? It's like you can put out quote-unquote hot takes and get – you can get the attention. You can get the exposure. But at a certain point, you have to say, okay, I'm doing – x million amount of people between twitter and instagram just from my thoughts and opinions Mm -hmm. um and it's really interesting to get caught up in the numbers and i did for a very long time i was like well this is clearly what i should be doing but then it's like okay well if i can do that just talking about your thing then if i am truly creative shouldn't i be able to create something which some other people would want to talk about yeah uh, and it's it's that, it's that challenge I feel, and I feel like you're kind of, and I would love to know this from you. Is this where um, you are currently as well? Of like, okay, I need a new challenge, and this podcast and the the video to complement it is the new yeah, thing for so you. So here's what happened. I'd say with that, um, when I texted hmm. you, because we had talked about doing this podcast a while ago, and it didn't end up fully working sure. out. Uh, well, this something didn't work out. I wanted to put it off until we had. Uh, I had enough equipment to uh, make it look good. Yeah. And what ended up happening was mm-hmm. when I most recently tested you a week or two ago, uh, I was on set working on a movie, and I'm actually going to be talking with the director of that next week. And uh, nice. we, thank you. we were working on that, and I was like, uh, I just sent in a script two days previous to that that uh, was turned down for me too expensive. And those were two projects that had been upcoming to me that I was like, okay, these are done now because that was the last day of me filming that. I was like, look, I need to do something new. So I was on the ride over mm. to the set, and I text my producer here, Carlos, and uh, we have brought up uh, working on a podcast before. Every time I text him, I go, I have big news. He goes, is it podcast related? And it's always been no. And I go, I have big news relating to a podcast this time. And it's because you had just, me and you had just gone over, and I was like, I need something new to do, and I need something new to create, and I feel like this is in my wheelhouse. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I mean, the setup is great. I like the I like the the shelves, Thank the you. books. It's a nice, uh, nice complimentary f- feng shui, as they call it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> you got a little different setup than you usually have in your videos, which uh, I do I do appreciate your setup. You yeah, know. I just basically changed the the, the lens and the the position okay. of the camera because before I was shooting with the eighty five millimeter mm-hmm. lens, uh, and you have to be yeah. at a distance, so it was like all the way at the other side of the room. But yeah, I just switched it up. Um, Consistency is difficult, and I, I think this will be something that you'll have to. I, I, ideally, you won't, but even with podcasting, it's like consistency really yeah. is everything. Um, it's very difficult to, because you know, it's we also live in a very metric driven world where people look at just the views and the followers and the likes and that sometimes sh- it's a very deadly trap mm-hmm. to fall in you know but if you love it if you love a good conversation if you love the idea of you know you and i are in different play- parts of the world but we're just getting on talking like we've known mm-hmm. each other for years yeah. so when you look at it and, and, br- and bring it down to that level it, it, it's a truly special thing that we're that we're able to do and i think these are important conversations that we should have more of yeah um so one of the things I wanted to go over with you earlier was uh, mm. what are you planning? Because I know you've been talking on your, your stories a lot about working in uh, film and stuff. And I see you've... What, what was that little sure. setup you built for your uh, your camera? Your little... Your homemade... No, wait. You got to... I don't know. Oh, uh, for the... For the... Uh, yeah, oh, you, made, the you made a gimbal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, for anyone watching or listening to this, just the way we gain knowledge now... It's pretty wild. Like, are you going to film school? No, I was going to film school, and uh, I had an opportunity to direct uh, a short that I had written, and it. Uh, yeah. I ended up leaving nice. to do that, and I've kind of just been working on my own, and. And no, and no, and, and no regrets. No, not that. not at all. I've been uh, going off, and I've been learning. Nice. I mean, Tarantino was working uh, in a VHS store when he, you know, got hired for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for so like, for when he got hired for Reservoir Dogs, I mean, he and he's the one who's always said, "You don't need an education; you don't need to go to school. If you love movies, you can't help but go exactly. on good movies. It's just what you'll do." So I was just watching. I had some free time, so I was just basically watching every single Christopher Nolan interview <laughs> I could go through within a couple of hour time span. 
And uh, one of the things he said is that you have to learn to be resourceful. Like you was talking about his first film. And, you know, when you see the man's creative evolution from his first films, when you go and watch something like Dunkirk, for example, it's, it's you know, it's, it's pretty inspiring to mm-hmm. watch that, right? And then, of course, he never officially went to film school. Yeah. So um, he, he spoke about being resourceful. And I, I, I've been trying to, to learn some of the dynamics of uh, camera operation and photography and things of that nature. Um, so I have this gimbal that I ordered that's just for, for the mm-hmm. iPhone, um, cause, cause the one for the DSLR is, is, is pretty out yeah, of the budget for right now. So, into. um, so I was just playing around and saying, okay, well, I like the slider shot. I like the pan shot, but if I hold it with the gimbal, it's still not stable enough. So how can I actually get this to work in a way? So I just was just playing around, put it on the tripod, and just kind of moved the the tripod a little, and it kind of gave me that motion. It's still not a perfect pan because you don't have a slider yeah. per se. Um, so the the tripod is actually fixed, obviously, in a location. So you're just kind of arching it and and panning. So it's not it's it's a different way of panning, but it worked. And I was like, okay, that that's interesting. So then, when you kind of get your feet wet in that regard, and even that, if that is the most basic thing, it's like it, it's such it's it's a domino effect yeah. mentally, because then you start seeing links in, in other places, and that ultimately I think helps your knowledge. Yeah. Uh, is you, you start connecting the dots in, in yeah. this weird way, and then that is that is true. That's and a lot of filmmaking is uh, you know ingenuity coming up with stuff on the fly and just having that mind for it exactly and, uh, i think but that is another one of the you know if you're going to weigh pros and cons of film school is uh you don't have to really worry about uh you know a gimbal being too expensive yeah. you know you you go there you'll yeah. fill out a a form and you'll get a gimbal and you'll get like thirty thousand dollars worth of lights really? <laughs> stuff like that you know i'm probably exaggerating i don't, I, I don't know what <laughs> I don't know where I was reading this, but I, it, it was something to the effect of you can get virtually um, any piece of equipment. That's the only real benefit yeah. of going to film school is the, the access yeah, well, you was, have. That was one of the pros that I considered, and one of the big cons was uh, I think it can be a bit restricting sometimes in terms of creativity because I'm mm-hmm. personally, I'm more of a, when it comes to film, I'm more of a pre-production. I'm a, I'm a, I guess myself more of a writer than a, a filmmaker, and that's something I've been coming to terms with recently. But... Uh, and one oh, of my, nice. one of the things that made me, that kind of pushed me away from the film school I was going to, was uh, our final for this one semester was to do a, a fake news broadcast. And they go, we have a pre-made script mm. for you guys, you guys have to film it, or you guys can write your own. So I wrote my own, and I handed it in to my professor so he can verify it, and he, he hand, looked at it, and he goes, this is one of the funniest things a student's ever turned into me. He goes, but this is not close enough to nice. a news broadcast, so you can't do it. And in my mind, I was like, Damn. but it's a news broadcast. There's two people sitting there talking. They just get in for problems about alcoholism mm. and how they hate world affairs. <laughs> but I was like, and that's what made me angry. I was like, this is n- semantics, and you're restricting me over semantics. Mm. And I think that was one of the things where when I got an opportunity to go off and do my own thing and intern at a studio, I was like, you know what, forget this. I'm going to do what I want, and I'm going to try to make it work. That's something I've been struggling with as well is uh, – if we live in an age where restriction is, is, is at an all-time low, right, um, it's it's those traditional structures, like the semantics that you pointed out, that, that are really interesting. Because why would you want to first do that to something that you're also acknowledging is 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 funny, is creative, is, is original, is the, the, the best of something that you've seen? Yeah. Um, why would you try to exactly. box that in? It's I, pretty wild. I agree. Well, what do you look at for, uh, say, screenwriters or script writers or just writers in general that have uh, inspired you or that you look up to or you want to try to emulate? Are you going to say Chris Terrio? <laughs> um, I like Terrio, but I, I, I'm more fascinated with someone like Nolan. I, I, I saw that. Well, I, I, Nolan's really interesting, I think. Yeah, very. Because I don't think he's objectively made a poor no, film yeah, at I, all. I agree. Even uh, once he's made, I don't love. It's like these are well made on mm. every regard. It just doesn't click with me. Yeah. And you can kind of just see his passion not only bleed over when he's speaking about film, but I mean, you see it in the product itself. You 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 see that this is someone very much in love with what yeah. he's doing. Um, and I think if you can create something like that, that if that evokes that. Then, then you're on the right path with whatever it is you and want to do. I think he's the most, might be the most versatile in terms of 
film genre mm, super exactly because, um and i think it kind of speaks when he made uh dunkirk i was like wow what's gonna be mm. the crazy twist in this because there's no way christopher nolan's making just a straightforward world war movie and he did and again it wasn't my cup of key yeah. my uh, my cup of key my cup of tea but I did like uh, I, yeah. I I liked a lot of elements of it, and I it was objectively really well made. So his twist was yeah, not his twist was not twist. having a twist, and it just shows that he yeah. can do what he sets his mind to, you know. See versatility. I'm 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 so happy you said that because that is something that I also that is something that I have consciously worked towards incorporating with the nice cast. Um, where if 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 you've kind of followed me, you, you'll know that I can tie in so many different subjects or broad conversations into something even if it's a superhero yeah. film we can pick out any superhero film right now and i'll be able to bring in a, a much larger conversation about maybe artistic freedom or um or homogenization of superheroes or whatever and it's all saying that you know that is because i want to be as versatile right. as possible i'd be able to speak about as many different subjects um, as possible as well. But what, what happened was, what I didn't account for is uh, kind of the accessibility of how easy it is to do. Um, in terms of like getting on Twitter, like coming up with a hot take is not something unique. Yeah, I, I saw you talking it about that. It may be unique recently. because it, yeah, it may be unique because, well, obviously it's my thought and everyone has their own set of unique thoughts. But the to me, if I see a hot take that really gets a reaction out of me i look at the person with the hot take and i want to know more about that person i'm like damn you actually said something that really had me thinking um but with the way people consume content on social media that's it's just not the climate for it which is also another reason why uh i had to really have that tough conversation of like okay we need to create something that that will be contextually different. So maybe if I'm talking, like, if you speak about a hot take in a meme, it's different than if there is that same theme coming up in a, in a book or a script or you're actually seeing it on camera in a film, a short story, or whatever. So once you change the context, you literally change everything else. Um, and, and that realization really prompted a lot of things as well. So. And yeah, so um, that's making me think as you were talking uh, about what you're going to be doing with your account. I see your... Uh, the nice cast, what we see on your online profiles, is that going to be tied in heavily to mm. what you create as a filmmaker? Uh, maybe on like just the production logo or something. Okay. Um, because the nice cast actually, Clay Enos. If you know about Clay Enos, he's a still photographer. Uh, he, this is embarrassing because I'm Indian. I should have known this. Um, he put me on to like the double entendre of the nice cast. Obviously, there's the 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 cast of podcasting. Or if you're a YouTube video creator, you're casting your ideas out there. But there's also like the caste system in India back in the day, which was like the social hierarchy. Um, so that double entendre was there that I never even thought of. So um, I do. So I could kind of work with that as like the nice cast productions or something like that. But it wouldn't be um, the nice cast wouldn't be like any part of the film name or the book name or anything right. like that. Okay. All right, that's, I think that's what a lot of people I think want some uh need uh not need would like clarification on is what you're gonna be doing with your uh the future of you as the nice cast are you yeah because uh, i know you clarified and we've gone over this that you don't want to be uh oh i don't like the mcu i don't do this and i think it's interesting like, <laughs> uh, like you said it, it you you need something that is going to creatively keep you inspired yeah. mm -hmm. you know um and it's kind of yeah, I mean, it really is is that simple, as oversimplified as that may seem. You you need something that's going to constantly keep you on your toes. And what ha also happened was of like everyone is talking about a like birds of praise coming out, <laughs> yeah. right? So if everyone is going to be sharing their opinion on birds of prey, and you are here, like, okay, well, I can have a more insightful conversation about this film. It gets lost because how many different birds of praise reviews do we need on Not social enough. media how many people how many different <laughs> how many different inputs do we need and we're constantly just have this this data overload you know but all the information isn't it's very i think the official term is a microwave content mm -hmm. i don't know if you've ever no. heard that before where it's just very short form it's like uh, 30 seconds or so and then you're on to well, the that's next the, one that's the kind um, of this happens when, uh what 
the world's looking like with entertainment. You know, the first thing was it's like entertainment's it, like it's TikToks and it was it was vines and now it's YouTube videos under ten minutes and now it's all that. And what and what's crazy is even with I think significant events, it's like people were really upset and hurt and distraught by Kobe's death. Uh, they changed their profile picture for a couple of hours. And then they're back to posting thirst yeah. traps. <laughs> like, like like a day later, you're back to posting booty pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> a man just passed away who you claim you loved and had a profound impact on you you were inspired by. And here you are just back to back to normal after a day. It's like we don't have time to grieve. We don't have time to, to reflect. We don't have time for any of the things that you actually need, I think, and to be think a healthy person. Uh a side effect of the market people need to do this to stay relevant like you can focus on kobe for a couple hours but if you want to stay relevant you need to move back to what you're doing before 100 100 percent, 100 percent. it's not it's not i don't feel like it's genuine and maybe that's a little bit too cynical on my part but i don't it, i'll use myself as an example because that's all i can do anything i've ever spoken about is something that i'm into yeah. Um, that I'm a fan of, that I feel like, okay, I can relay my opinion or perspective on this because I'm actually into mm -hmm. this. So I don't just post about something because other people are posting yeah. about it. Like Game of Thrones, like an idiot. Game of Thrones at its height, I didn't post a single thing about. And towards the tail end on the very final season that the people the, when people hated it the most and were like, all right, we're done with Game of Thrones is when I started to post about it because then I started to watch mm -hmm. it. And a lot of people will just possibly see a tweet or a meme and say, okay, well, this is picking up traction. So here, let me go, let me go make a Game of Thrones meme. And they've never even watched a single thing. Um, so yeah, I think what, what you're getting at is 100% true of like, where, where's the genuine people that are speaking about things because they're truly yeah. into it? And them. I think you're, I uh, think you're and very I, genuine in what you talk about and i know I that's the consensus that. of you i was having a conversation with this uh about you the other day um that some people yeah. think that you don't 100 percent believe your hot takes and i go i think he does because uh, they tell me their exact words <laughs> I they said their exact words were there's no way this guy has every unpopular opinion on earth i go well someone <laughs> out there has to and i said i think he does have these unpopular opinions and I think that maybe he realizes that this is your market, and I think maybe your more popular opinions, you uh, you realize there's not as much market in talking about them. But I do think that everything that you say that's controversial, I really do believe that you think all these things. I do yeah. believe. <laughs> See, there's there's one thing I said that was at the time considered a hot take, but I was a complete idiot for. Now was Marvel saying that Captain movie. Marvel. Was <laughs> I remember exactly. Okay. Which I which I apologize I saw, for. I saw you responding to a comment apologizing on that. So here's, and I was a prisoner of the moment. I saw it, and I'm like, okay, this, in my opinion, uh, is different enough of an MCU film for me to say it's a good movie. Uh, but then I bought it when it came out on digital. Watched it that night, and it, it did not. It did. I was like, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> and here's uh, something I want to talk about. Uh, and this is a little bit of a mm. segue as well because uh, uh, it's something you've been talking about recently was uh, fans who hate, you know. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm someone who hates, but I would say I'm someone who follows you not because I agree with what you say, but because I disagree with what mm. you say. And I want to see what crazy thing you say next. But see, <laughs> and but, but see, you will challenge me. And also, like, you invited me on for this podcast, right? As stupid as it may seem, it was a sign of respect. That to me it was like okay, you didn't need to tell me that you that you respect me. I understood, right? So that's what I that's exactly what I mean. When you say that you notice that the camera setup was different, mm -hmm. right? Even if you disagree with what I'm saying, and whatever, that still tells me that you're still supportive enough of whatever it is that yeah. I want to do to notice these things, right? So. That to me is something that, okay, if you dislike me, if you want to make a troll account, why I call you a fan <laughs> is because you're not doing that for anyone. Like, you're not just making account. a troll yeah, account. I don't have a troll account. Anyone. I made a video the other day about. <laughs> no one trolls me. <laughs> I made a video. 
I made a video the other day about um, being the most hated on Instagram. And so many people commented and said, you can't be the most hated on Instagram with just 4,000 followers. And what I was truly befuddled by with that was like, how many people with six-figure followers do you know who get this level of no, hate? You definitely are. So, me and my producer talking about uh, that video because I sent him some stuff. I go, I don't. I say in the context of what he is, he can very justifiably mm. say that he is definitely one of the most disliked. You have like eight troll <laughs> accounts. And I would say this, eight. the kind cast and is the, the greatest account on Instagram. One. I'm sorry. I love, I love <laughs> the kind cast because <laughs> they have your way of speaking right. down. Listen, it's, this, this was a great interview, uh, Vander. I got to go. All right. <laughs> no, I'm just joking because you said. Uh, I figure. Yeah, I know. Because you, you support you, the kite cast. Because you. Because you picked up, up the, the kite cast. cast. I picked you up too. I uh yeah no uh but I mean if I was in your position and I saw someone who parodied me that well I mean I'd be like this is the I would think this is the funniest thing I know you love no context kind cast you shouted them out. Yeah, I, I like the kind cast too. I guess <laughs> the kind like it's it's interesting um, you know because. But see, they they took they took it to a different level. Now there's like the N word um, cast. There's the the nicer nicer cast. There's the nicest. They're running out cast. of parody names. It's like it's 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 getting too much now. You're all gonna kill it. There's an they, they have a group chat which they added me to. It's called the Cast <laughs> Collective. I think they did kill it because <laughs> I don't think they post much anymore. Um, the kind cast has been yeah. dead. Um, but I think that also speaks to what you are as a creator because. You have a very unique way of speaking, and you have your catchphrases and your paraphrases. You have a, you have a <laughs> stay low and build is something uh, I'll say. Stop. Stop. Yeah, stop. And you, and you, you meme that stuff, too. <laughs> have you considered at any point yeah. in time kind of embracing being a meme? Mm, yes, but not in a way where I feel like I got to create mm -hmm. it. Like, I don't want to create, like, if it, t if it happens naturally, then great. Um, like, everything up until this point, the parody accounts, when people screenshot and they make a meme or whatever, it, it's all been unintentional yeah. on my end. I, I, I never said anything to say, okay, this well, is what this is a, <laughs> exactly. Because I don't think you can play No, it has to be like organic. That. And, and that's, I'm so happy. I'm so happy you brought that up because now it feels like a lot of people are just trying to go mm -hmm. viral. But if you look at the the actual essence of going viral, it's something unplanned. It's something that takes on a life of its own, which you technically really can't plan yeah. for. If you want an example of that, uh, um, the new Star like, Wars, that little guy, little that Babu Frick, that guy, they were not planning on him being viral. He had like... I didn't even <laughs> like that character <laughs> at all. He just person. says, hey. <laughs> but what did you think of The Rise of Skywalker, by the way? Now that it's, we're talking about Star Wars. Um, I think it was uh, f an unoffensive ending to a trilogy, and I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. And I, But I don't... Okay. See, when you walk out of it, and I think you and everyone else who's being reasonable will agree with this, you're like, that was not a sad... It didn't, and it didn't give you any big finale moments. Say what you want about Endgame, but they brought everyone back for a yeah. giant epic battle. Their equivalent of that mm. to this is a bunch of ships flying in with nobodies in them. And then hearing some voices. Mm. There was no big finale moment. There was no big satisfying. So I just kind of left saying that's how you're going to end. It just felt like any other Star Wars movie. Like you can continue it after this, you know. The, the interesting. And you like the and you like the Last Jedi because I think that's an important no. conversation. If if you're going to talk about the rise, of I Skywalker. don't like the Last Jedi, but I don't dislike it in the way a lot of other people do. I don't like the way okay. they handled Luke, but I like that concept. Mm. And I don't like the people who run around okay. saying, oh, Luke shouldn't be like that. Because characters grow and they change. And I think keeping mm. this guy as like this mythical, you know, he's perfect and he's flawless. I think evolving him into someone who's just been beaten down and cynical and using that as a double-ended commentary on how people look at the Star Wars franchise. I think that's way more interesting than, and I had a conversation with this at a friend at work, his ideal ending would be for him to roll up and stab Snoke and be like, oh, mm. this is the guy who trades you to Kylo. And then one turns out, go, how would that be satisfying? How would that be interesting? And how would that challenge a writer? How could a writer sit mm. down and be like, this is how I want to challenge myself with this script is just do the most blatant, obvious thing. So I want to, I want to, I want to also then send this question to you as a writer and creator yourself. 
isn't challenging the audience shouldn't that be the goal for everyone yeah i i definitely agree i think there's moments and do you feel the mcu does that not always okay do you feel bvs does that let me hmm because 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 the last jedi is the bvs I, of star I very wars much agree so i'm luke skywalker is bruce wayne in that yeah. film um yeah, the, the 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 last Jedi is the BVS. I will of give you that because I Wars. don't like them both, and I. Do. <laughs> but no, I I agree, <laughs> and I, I I very much agree, and I know why you like both of them. Um, BVS, okay. I think there needs to be a distinction between challenging people and doing something that people don't like, because you could say that I'm challenged okay. by BVS. But I also think it's more of mm. that I don't like where they went. I think challenging is it okay? Here, here, here. I think challenging people is so. So, so would that be ch challenging versus subverting expectations? I think. Or are, are those two things mutually exclusive? I or think what? they're usually. Hmm. I think it depends on how you present it because obviously subverting mm. people's expectations is going to challenge them. But you know, if you want to look at Captain Marvel. They subverted my expectations by slashing out Nick Fury's eye with a cat. That's <laughs> subverted my expectations, point. but it didn't challenge me. <laughs> I was <clears throat> I was didn't upset. Um, I think BVS. See, this is my problem. I think as I'm getting more into this, I think I can speak about it from that context now. So, my overall issue with the MCU would be that I do believe Marvel characters have much more to them than what they have been presented mm -hmm. as um and i also think uh, why i why i gravitate so much towards bbs and towards something like the last jedi is <sighs> i feel like those are gray area superhero films what do you mean by that bbs mm -hmm. for example what i mean by gray area is that if you look at any of the characters if you look at bruce if you look at Clark, if you look at Lex, each of them have a unique perspective on the world and the central character, which is Superman. Mm -hmm. So Bruce and Lex are equally threatened by Superman's existence. Yeah. Bruce is more of a um, philanth philanthropical, um, we need to do it for the future of the entire world. Lex, is, Lex has more of a selfish driven view of yeah. Superman. He, that is that is disguised on um it being more philanthropical right so for lex i think superman's existence is, is pure insecurity yeah. for him <clears throat> so each of that each of if you if you view BV, bvs from each of those lenses i feel like it tells an equally similar story mm -hmm. than if you view it through like you have three essentially three separate stories occurring within mm -hmm. one film so I feel like Marvel characters have the ability to do that. But when you take something and just package it and, 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 and just give a solution by the end, it kind of paints the world as black and white and the perspective yeah. is lost. Like Civil War, it tidies up pretty nicely. Like you, you know that these guys are going to get together again. There's never a moment where I felt like, okay, I'm like, Captain America really hates Iron Man. I never got yeah. that. Never ever got that. And if you, I felt like if the MCU was to dig into some of the the nuance and the quote unquote gray area, those characters could be amazing on film. But but but, but the way they're presenting them is like there has to be an audience for that, right? Like people don't want to go to a superhero movie and think yeah. about things. <laughs> you want to go. You want to go. You want to see some cool stuff. You want to laugh. You want to have a good. Uh, a fan, you want to be able to take your family and then you want to be done yeah. with it and say well that was fun yeah. and, th and that's exactly it. and there's nothing wrong with that but it also depends on the characters you're dealing with like, I think that's fine for Transformers <laughs> I think that's fine for like Disney live action remake I think that's fine for Aladdin but for superheroes in today's world I think superheroes should be very complicated characters I, I agree with that and as much as I do enjoy the MCU, I'll never be one to run around and tout it as like, this is so philosophically complex. This is going to challenge your worldview mm. and you will walk out of this changed. I will say that I think a lot of people miss mm. Winter Soldier's uh, 
uh, commentary on uh, uh, just on so on. I don't want to say society because I'm not the Joker. Uh, on just people and culture and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I think it's yeah, I think it's a really 100%. interesting commentary on uh, people giving up rights in exchange for security. And I think it's they basically made a movie where the plot was revolved around. I think it was was it Andrew Jackson that said, or was it Benjamin Franklin that said, uh, "Any man who would sacrifice liberty for security deserves neither." And that's the premise of the film, is that the. And it makes you wonder if the Russo brothers were able to create that, and then you watch their other efforts afterwards. How much are they being restricted in the story they want to tell? I, oh, for and and Doctor Strange too, of course, where with the idea of like, okay, this is gonna be have horror yeah, elements, uh, and then you find yeah, he out. he left. And then Edgar Wright also with Ant Man. Yeah, there's definitely um, a reason I've always said I wouldn't want to. Well, not always. I've in the past year or two have said I would never want to make an MCU movie because what I want to do they wouldn't mm. like. Okay, if Kevin Feige kicked in my door right now with a contract said sign this, you can make a Moon Knight movie. I'd sign it. But if I had some kind of career and I was fine, and they said here, would you please write this? I'd probably say no because I I even had it like mm. I've obviously kicked around ideas in my head for like if I was working for them, what would I do? And I always had these ideas like, well, they would never agree to this. They would never agree to this. They would never agree to this. And I think that's one of the issues. I think that's the biggest downside of Disney owning uh, the MCU. It's like, yeah, we, we yeah. get like the fluff superhero content and it's reliably like you like it. You're going to get that in the way you like it two or three times a year. And that's cool because like I like a movie where I can shut my brain. Well, not shut my brain off where I don't have to shut my brain off and it'll be fine and I'll get a laugh and I'll get some people in costumes knocking each other around. Mm. And I like that. But I would also like something like Logan or like the Joker or Dark Knight, you know. And yeah. I think the Joker is an interesting thing because I think I think if you this is something that I've wondered about the Joker. Is it because the character is such that we allow Joker more of a leeway to challenge us as opposed to if a Batman or Superman film was that dark? Um I think people would want a Batman film I, to be dark. That's anyone I know who's a okay. big Batman fan is going to hmm. want a dark Batman film. What they don't want is Batman splattering people's brains on the wall with a giant crate because <laughs> the whole character of Batman and the thing that people find so interesting hmm. that they found interesting about him for like 60 years is that this guy's going up against hmm. people who have superpowers who can crush buildings or someone like the Joker who doesn't have any superpowers, but is able to push him to his limit and that he doesn't break and he won't do that, that's mm. what people like. So they like Batman set across a darker mm. world, backdrop it against it, mm. but they don't like it when he gives into it. And I think that's one of the biggest pushbacks in BVS is um, I think the people who worked on the movie had this uh, mindset that if the world that Batman's in is darker, then, then he's going to be darker to match it. But I think that the whole purpose mm. of the character is that the world that he's in is darker. He's going to be, you know, more resistant to that because that's the crux of his character. And that's his, he's the unstoppable force or the immovable object. That's a, that's interesting. That's interesting. And I think that's interesting. At the same time, I'm not completely opposed to anyone in any mm. time ever doing what Zack Snyder did. Like, I'm not going to be like, never do mm. this. There can never be a story where Batman kills people. I just don't think that introduced mm. because for a lot of DC fans, this is seeing Batman and Superman done like right with our modern technology at the height of superhero films. And a lot of people are going to see this version mm. of Batman and that's going to be the defining version of the character for the next 40 years. And people, comic book fans don't want people thinking that Batman is going to go around shooting flamethrowers, burning people alive, blowing people up, branding people. <laughs> because they're going to say like, well, this people yeah. have the wrong idea of this character that I love and I've loved for my whole life. And I think that's the big thing. Mm. But he didn't shoot the. He didn't shoot the. He didn't. Well, he shot the flamethrower. Flame yeah, flame yeah. That's. He shot. The, he shot the flamethrower. It's. It's not. It's yeah, not the I same. know. <laughs> but see, could couldn't you put that up against? I. I don't. I'm not gonna kill you, but I don't have to save I, you. But I, that's those, that I hate, and I think a lot of Batman fans hate that too. I always have people shitting on that moment. It doesn't get the same level of like vitriol. I think it's because. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 it's because people won't talk about Batman Begins, man. They talk about Dark Knight. <laughs> like, no one cares about Batman <laughs> Begins. That movie has weirdly shot action. And and the third act of that movie feels so weirdly disconnected from the rest of it. It feels like a totally different movie. You well, think so? it turns into a more generic comic mm. book movie, whereas the first was a more in line with the Dark Knight of being like a really toned 
crime drama. And then the last act is like, oh, I have this bomb and I was going to go crazy and I released the crazies from the asylum and I have a speeding train in the sky. I'm going to yeah. blow it up and I'm going to blow up the whole city, guys. And I got ninjas that fall from the sky that look mm -hmm. like chess pieces. And uh, so it does yeah. feel like a different movie. And I think, but here's the thing is... Drive... No, so I'm saying drive this Batmobile to Wayne <laughs> Tower and make sure yeah, you knock Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's... Yeah, Conveniently. It's so, and I think that's yeah. why... And that's why... Uh, Keaton Batman doesn't get flack for dropping a bomb on his chemicals and killing 50 people because that movie's cartoony. Yeah. You know, I, I think with BVS, it's the thing is we were at the height of superhero, you know, uh, fanfare. People love superheroes and it was going up against Civil War, which is going to be like, this is, this is it. This is the superheroes punching each other year. This is Daredevil versus Punisher. This is Captain America versus Iron Man. This is Batman versus mm. Superman. It was that year. And I think that, uh, but yeah, I do see a lot of people. I think if you bring anytime Ring of Batman begins, you'll see similar levels of hate for the. See, but what also another I think why BVS is I think the most fascinating superhero film personally, uh, in my opinion, is um, it also shows a lot of what's wrong with social media. Um, where when that film came out, first of all, that film is nowhere objectively as bad as people said it was, right? Um, so then you now you have a situation where people are saying things that they don't really believe because if a film comes out and it's getting trashed, mm -hmm. right? If everyone is leaning towards that direction, that is a immediate red flag because there's no way all of you like people don't agree on the internet about <laughs> things. <laughs> that that's true. So why are we all why are we all agreeing that this is trash? Some of you are being disingenuous then. Because then you have to, you, if there was an equally polarizing split opening weekend, and there is more now, because now it's become cool to say, oh, BVS is a lot yeah. better. Uh, oh, wow. You think that's, that's uh, like we Yang Lang and culture. We actually, you think so? That, and, yeah. the, but, and, and that kind of that, applies to what we were talking about earlier. Are you, fami are you familiar with uh, Greg Miller? Greg Mill See, I, I just saw someone talking about him. He's, Greg, uh, he, he's a media he the one that He used to work for oh, Someone made a meme about him when he, he when he was watching the Batman trailers. Batman was like, oh, "There's no way this yes. could be wrong. This could be bad." So, so here's an interesting thought I had. He, recently, I think he recorded a three-hour video uh, revisiting BVS, um, and he spoke. He speaks more affectionately about it today than he did when it came out. And this is a tricky part: is when it came out. It was cool to trash that film. That's what got you the... So, like, trashing that film got you enough views as if you came out and said, this is the best thing I've ever seen, right? Um, so it's not like opinions can't change. But as time has gone along, I think it's become clear that BVS is, is like a cult... It's becoming a cult classic. I won't call it a cult classic yet. I think another few years, it'll be there. But when you look at the, the fan base behind that film, it's very passionate. Yeah, I, it's definitely got um, a the lot people of who adore it. Snyder cut. It's exactly. So now, if you, as a creator, are looking for a way to... to to come up with content ideas, right? And you say this film was trash before, but now you're coming out and saying, well, BVS is great. And you're recording a three-hour podcast. How much of that is a genuine desire to make that video versus, wow, a shit ton of people uh, in film culture, in pop culture, are still highly intrigued for whatever reason by BVS? I got to now speak about it in a different way. Uh, I think it's because it's been a polarizing conversation because no, neither side is let go. And because of... Yeah. Um, here's a lot of what it is, is that DC, WB is clearly trying to move away from what Zack Snyder was doing. And, yes, and I think complete. that's making everyone get up in arms. So it's either you're going to be on the, this is great, I don't want that, let's go on to this. Or you're going to be like, Zack Snyder was amazing, how dare you do this to him? You know what's really ironic about that is I think uh, a birds of prey s set in the current state of the DCEU is, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't seen a single thing about that film that I personally think is compelling. Not one, right? I'm going to be called a sexist <laughs> for saying that, but whatever. Uh -huh. um, but I think that film in, in a Zack Snyder helmed DCEU as like the godfather, I think that's where it's compelling. It's kind of like, I, I kind of look at birds of prey as... Um, a DC version of Sucker Punch. Mm. 
where what some of the things Zach was trying to do with Sucker Punch would work perfectly with Birds mm. of Prey. Yeah, uh, I definitely could see some of the themes transferring over to it. Uh, and I think me and you are on the bandwagon of uh, not being interested in, uh, not the bandwagon, the, of not being interested in Birds of Prey. I'm like, when the trailer came out, I go, yeah. this is going to be bad. They're going to disrespect my guy, Black Mask. And I read all the leaks, and I was right. And I've been saying it since the first trailer that I'm not going to like this movie. And I was like, no, it looks cool now. And it's getting good reviews, like I said it was going to. And I haven't seen all mm. these memes about it. Have you noticed uh, every every DC movie gets a new the same reviews now? It's like, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, it's uh, a bold new take. Uh, DC is going in the right place. And, it's and, the best film it, since The Dark Knight. And, and how much is how much how many of those reviews are genuine about Birds of Prey? See, that's another conversation of this this predominantly female driven film. Can you be as a journalist or a reviewer? Can you be entirely objective? I think politics about is this definitely film? playing a big part in uh, uh, what you can say now, yep. especially in entertainment. Um, I think it's half and half. I don't think that, like, obviously, you know, being the all-women film isn't going to get you any fanfare. Ocean's 8, Ghostbusters, a lot of them have tanked. But I think that if you're mediocre, mm. I think it might give you a little more of a push to be like, yeah, this is all right, guys. And I, I think that's what you're Inter hearing. A lot of people who have seen it are like, this isn't offensive. Uh, if you, I got on Reddit, I've read all the leaks. Every person, just regular person on the media has been like, this is okay. It's nothing new. And then everyone mm. in the media is like, this is breaking new ground. This is going to change <laughs> my, uh, my whole worldview. But, uh, mm. and, it, and see, it's very, and it's like, okay, if you, if you, only someone, like, only you know your intent, yeah. right? So if you genuinely feel that way, great. And if you genuinely feel like that, then, then I feel like it will be felt yeah, by the viewer I, or the, or I the reader. I think that's an interesting conversation. A lot of, uh, people's uh, motive behind the reviews being called into 10. If you want to look at the MCU, you're getting a lot of, uh, oh, mm. Disney's paying people to do this. And I think it's hard. I think it's dangerous territory to like uh, try to decide people's intent behind what they're reviewing. Mm. But I don't think... What do you... Uh, this is me personally. I don't lean towards the side of uh, Disney's paying critics to like MCU movies. Because I don't either. And I think the... the the Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, exactly. I thought that, the Lion King, the Rise of Skywalker, it's getting uh, bad reviews. And I've had people straight up tell me like, "Oh, well, Kathleen Kennedy probably has a, a a little more respect." Like, you really think Kathleen Kennedy heard that you can slip fifty bucks to a critic to get a a plus review from them? Mm. And she's like, "No, I won't do that." I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. mm. you know. And I mean, you, you of everyone, you would know about holding on to unpopular opinions with, if you're going to do that in reviews, stuff like yeah. that. You're the unpopular opinion guy. But see, it just goes back to being genuine about mm -hmm. them. You know, it, it really does. You know, it, it's just, just say what you feel and feel what you say. It's very, it's, it's, it should be very simple, but it's not. Because the climate we live in is everyone is trying to to get as much exposure and attention as they want and it's like okay if this film comes out and everyone is speaking positively about it then that's the direction yeah. i gotta lean if this film comes out and everyone is hating about hating on it then that's the direction i should lean but i feel like the internet is a more interesting place if everyone is being themselves and that may sound cliche or whatever but it should not be about agreeing with one another right we don't agree on uh, agree on bvs we may not agree on any uh, another film as well but if that is how you feel and is genuine and you can share that and the other person can understand it i think that is where the compelling nature of the internet really yeah. comes out you don't want to have an echo mm -hmm. chamber yeah i i agree because what's what what's so fun in an echo chamber is it's just the same same sentiment getting yeah. repeated over and over again and who's really contri and that's what I say about the nice cast is I'm not doing anything radical or unique per se if everyone was being them themselves I wouldn't seem like the odd one out that's just my perspective mm -hmm. on it that's I I think you're right there definitely but I mean internet culture is not going to allow for that obviously <laughs> uh, it's just going to be you got to be right. uh, but I personally you know it's not like I know anyone who runs around 
you know, saying like, this is my opinion. And if I talk to him, I know this not, but I know there are people out mm. there, but I think that might be more in the, the Instagram influencers realm, you know, being fake. I think that like film nerds and comic book nerds are very passionate about what they actually think. You know, you know what I mean? Very and, passionate, they're de- yep. and I don't know any comic book people who are going to be sitting around being like, I love this movie when they don't actually love it, mm. you know? Um, cause I think that's just the nature of how it is. A lot of Instagram accounts, you'd be surprised. Yeah, you never know. Because, because, um, I've seen, I've seen a handful go from, okay, get over the Snyder cut, uh, and then Zach will post something and they'll go, oh my God, I need this <laughs> I, film. I, because... I would call someone out on that. Uh, I'm lucky enough out in Downey. One of my friends who, uh, you might know, cause I know you've butted heads, runs, uh, the Legion of Geeks on Instagram. And, uh. He's one yeah. of my good friends, and I, I, I'll respect him for holding his ground on I don't like BVS, and I don't like the Snyder Cut, and please stop talking about yeah. it. And I know it'd probably get him you know, more views and more exposure if he was to be like, oh my god, Zack Snyder posted this. So you know, I respect mm. him for sticking there to his guns go. on that. So, and that's, that's respectable in yeah. its own way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, I guess we're going to be drawn to the end of this. Or I think we've hit the hour mark now, so I'm going to ask you so a couple more questions. Yeah. 58. 58 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, do you think having more of a public persona now that you're leaving... Okay, so, okay. let me go back. Let me rewind. I'm going to say, having your own platform on Instagram and it being you and mm. you telling yourself what to say, being someone who works in film and stuff, do you think that that's going to affect what you're able to say? You know? Um. It's very interesting you asked that because I was thinking about this earlier, uh, and it kind of goes to part of the earlier when we were speaking about just you know when you said that you uh, in regards to the the comedic script you wrote and you said well why are you going to put boundaries on on me why are we putting just for semantics purposes um, I kind of had the same thought earlier today about what am I going to be able to say or what would I want to say if things start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and what I like is that I don't necessarily have, um, like, there's no corporate entity telling me, like, I have complete freedom in, 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 in a certain sense. And I'm, I'm very intrigued by the idea of having a, an entity on the internet that is free from all influence mm-hmm. like that. Because for the longest <laughs> time, for example, I tried to get into the press junket mm-hmm. thing. Um, I had a, a lot of ideas on how to how to evolve the press junket experience. Yeah, so about those on your Instagram. Act, a, 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 actors don't feel like they're just sitting there talking about a film that they got paid for, and they're just being asked redundant questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that I I thought there was a lot of space uh, to kind of innovate in that in that or in that place, but. Then I started to think that, okay, if that didn't pan out, you know, it's the, the age-old question of is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? Glass is half empty because that could have been a great amount. Uh, like, I could have built a great network mm-hmm. doing that, right? So I, I, I could have had a, a, a network of celebrities that I could have collaborated with in the future. It would have opened up yeah. doors. But the glass half full is that then would I be limited in the way I could speak yeah. about things if I had those relationships? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have those relationships virtually yeah. at all um <laughs> so and i'm intrigued by that i'm intrigued by being able to say whatever it is that you genuinely feel and i feel like for, you know it's the gift and the curse money or corporate sponsorship and things like that i feel like it compliment it complicates yeah. the process yeah and so the, so my my goal i think would be if if i can be fan funded i think that that there's so many people that are fan funded now on YouTube and stuff. I'm not on that level yet. So I don't have enough of a presence there to yeah. warrant that. Um, yes. Which is partly why I, have, I haven't started a Patreon. But I like the idea of fan funding because it's saying that you're only being backed and yeah. supported by people that really want to know your, your raw, unfiltered mm-hmm. perspectives. So yeah. that's a very long-winded way of yeah. answering your right, question. And the last I'm going to ask, and it branches off of what we were just mm. talking about, why do you think it's so hard to get uh, followers to move between platforms? I know you've mentioned that the YouTube success has ah, long eluded the lice. How cast. much time do we have, Vander? How much time do we have, my um, guy? <laughs> let's see where it goes. Um, I don't think we're going to spend two hours talking about it. This <laughs> is something that has kept me up so many nights. You don't have 
any freaking idea. And if you ask one of the accounts that does not like me, they're going to tell you it's because I'm not likable. <laughs> That's why they won't convert over, which I think is complete BS because I wasn't always this unlikable. There was a time where I was <laughs> there was a time where I was politely asking for you to go uh, hit the link or subscribe or whatever. And it didn't it didn't it didn't cross over. So see I'll I'll chat I'll raise your question with this question. All right. Okay? Because I've been looking at Doolittle. With oh, no. Robert Downey I'm Jr. Sorry. Let me pull it up <laughs> right now. I've heard um, nothing but atrocities. Okay, so Doolittle, mm-hmm. right? Um, has a worldwide grow box office of ninety four thousand five hundred and eighteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so for all intents and purposes, that film is a flop because the budget of that film is one seventy five. <laughs> now. That film has an actor who has a decade's worth of goodwill with audiences. One of the most beloved actors with the currently MCU. working. You know. That actor went on the biggest platform yeah. um, mm-hmm. in, in, in terms of media currently with the Joe Rogan experience to promote his film. So, why is that film a flop? Now, why didn't fans of robert downey jr convert over to go support this film so then initially i would beat myself up about it i'd be like well my influence is just not that big for me to ask people to click a link and they'll do it um so okay fine that's gonna come over time that's gonna come over more trust and more of a, the more people see me the more people get to know my content that'll eventually mm-hmm. happen but i think what it comes down to is that the way content is um, consumed today, right? It's very, if it's of interest to you, there's no urgency for you to go get it, okay? So if I put out a video that says the secrets of the universe on YouTube, if you aren't thinking about life or the universe or in a dark place, struggling you're not like there's no urgency for you to click on that video you may need it at a later time in life and you'll go watch it when you watch it and that is exactly what it is now it's like content is consumed when you want it to be consumed um it's not necessarily where like i gotta unless it's like a a a world-changing experience like endgame where it's an experience you want to be there day one i don't feel like a lot of a lot of pieces of content now have that urgency where I, I need to go consume this this mm-hmm. moment. Um, then another thing is that you have to create stuff that people care about, okay? Or people are intrigued by. Now, I think you as a creator, if, if you haven't reached the struggle yet, I think you will as, as you progress later on too, is the, sometimes what you want to create is not consistent with what other people yeah, want. that's definitely true. So now you have you have a very difficult decision to make. Do I just make stuff that is gonna get me likes? Because I could I, I actually had an idea for this uh, towards the tail end. I didn't do it because I was going through my little self doubt thing of like hating myself and self loathing. But I had an idea of putting out this thing called Film of Decade, and I was gonna say Film of Decade Batman v Superman. Now I'm certain that would have generated enough interest for a couple of reasons. One, Film of Decade. I think is an interesting. Um, I think it's an interesting selling point. Two, it's BVS. People, a, a movie that the majority of people do not like. So how can you call that the film of the decade? It's a video I was playing. I didn't do it, but you did make a post about. I it. think that would have got. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would have got people to click over because they're into that. They're intrigued mm-hmm. by that. But for whatever reason, I didn't want to make it. Now, I could probably go make that video tomorrow with a different title about BVS. But it's like, I don't want to talk about BVS that much anymore, contrary to popular <laughs> belief, right? Like, I'm, I'm headed on yeah. a different path. So that's another thing of the, of the dilemma or the crossroads of what the creator wants to talk about and make versus what the people are actually searching for. And that's why I'm in conflict with the idea of know your audience, because 
does the audience even really know what they want? Like, I feel like a lot of people need to be told what uh, they James want. James Gunn was talking about of, that recently because they were sp they were asking him to put say? a song in the Last Guardians of the Galaxy, and he said, "I'm not going to do that because everyone's asking me to." He said, "I'd much rather give people something they don't know they want than what they do know they want." Exactly. And if you look into Steve Jobs, that's what makes Steve Jobs such an expert salesman. It's like when when he showed the iPad. Uh, for the first time, people looked at it and said, why, why, why do I need this? It's just a bigger <laughs> iPhone, right? But the way he said it is that once you get your hands on it, once you see it, it's a different browsing experience with a bigger screen. And then they obviously when it comes out, they put it in, in Apple stores uh, so people can play around with it. Now people are playing around with it. And now they go, okay, he's showing us something we didn't even know we needed, right? As opposed to if he just said, here, here's an iPad, go get it. It's a different. It's a, it's a different thing. Um, so that also comes, I think, from experience and confidence, where you can put something out and really direct people um, to that place of saying, "Go support this. This is something you don't need." And for me, right now, I, I was also thinking about just philosophy today. Right? Maybe you can help mm -hmm. me out with this. Are there any modern day philosophers who want to figure life out who are really asking questions? I feel like philosophy. Modern philosophy is just telling people how to feel. Yeah, right. You can shoot, you can you can put these ideas and these concepts on people, back it up with some science, and say, okay, this is that, and then it kind of just takes on a life of its own. But is are, are there people really like back in the day asking themselves where do we come from? What is the purpose of life? What is like these are important conversations that I feel like I want to have now, and I know that. YouTube algorithms, whatever people's interests, these are not going to be popular videos. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that that's the struggle. But what do you think about um, that? I would say that I'm sure there are people out there talking about that, and I don't know who that is. <laughs> I'm really, cause, and that's a struggle for me to say, because I'm interested in philosophy. I try to include philosophy in what I write. But uh, I look more mm. at uh, older philosophy. I look at, uh, I've been looking a lot at, and his name's in my mind right now, but uh, just uh, uh, other people. Uh, uh, but I'm so I'm more in tune with older philosophy. I'm, but again, I mean, I'm not sure there's someone out there. There are people talking about. Do you try to weave those concepts into definitely. your writing, or do those? Yeah, and yeah, the writer nice. who philosopher whose name is slipping my mind. I'm writing a a horror film based on his book Repetition, and he used a, nice. the the surname. I, I can remember his fake name was Constantine Constantius. And that, I can remember mm. the fake name that he used, but I can't remember his actual name. But uh, do do you feel like we have modern day philosophers? I know there's someone out there, and I just can't think of it. I mean, I know. I mean, yeah. I know there is. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, my life is currently preoccupied with my nine to five job, writing and video games. Mm. So I need to. If I, I'll get back to you. I'll find someone, and when we're done here, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> send you the links. What game? What games are you playing or what games are you excited Cyberpunk. for? It's released on my birthday. Got pushed back onto it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that'll be interesting when it comes out. And I guess we will talk about that. Uh, but that'll have to be uh, next time because I think we've hit the over hour mark, which I guarantee we have. Yeah. But this has been All great. Right. Thank yeah, you. It was really good having you on. Yeah, it was man. really interesting having you. It's been it's great talking to you. I think we said a lot of cool stuff. Likewise. I, I think we uh, talked about a lot of yeah, different we things. Yeah, we covered a broad range of topics and uh yeah I'll, i mean we'd we'll <laughs> love to have you back on eventually you know at some point and of if course. you ever need me for anything thank you, you want me to work on anything i'd be more than happy to all right sure. thank you it's been great talking with you likewise my man.